So first of all, I want to apologize for putting such a vague title into your uh, agenda. It's something about upcoming stuff. <laughs> the reason simply is that the machine I'm just about to talk about wasn't released at that time when I wrote that. In fact, the machine was released just a couple of hours before uh, the opening event of the GNU Tour Squadron. So I proudly present the IBM Z15. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the IBM Z15 comes in two flavors. It's the classic mainframe Z15 on the left and the Linux One version 3 on the right, especially tailored for Linux customers with an elastic pricing model for running thousands of containers under Linux. Between these two machines, there is no substantial technical difference. <laughs> In fact, it, the CPU is, <laughs> yeah, there's a visual difference, right? <laughs> the CPU is exactly the same, so everything we talk about in that presentation applies to both machines. Yeah, what IBM did is they, we shrank the, the size of the mainframe, of the frame of the mainframe, <laughs> down to 19 inches now. The, its predecessor was uh, 24 inches, I think, and it was known to mess up compute center layouts around the world. Customers complained about that, and now we have 19-inch industry standard rack size. These, uh, these two machines here uh, are in, in two-box configuration. Depending on the configuration, you can, can have one box, up to four boxes. Yeah, and on the next slide, a few facts about the CPU. On the left, lower left, there is a picture of the of the entire chip. You see the L3 structures in the middle and the 12 cores around it. Compared to IBM Z14, we now have 12 cores. We had 10 before. A single core, there's a picture on the upper right. You can see the, the L2 cache. There is a load store unit containing the L1 cache. Then there's the execution units, of course, sequencing unit, decode unit. And there is a COP, it's a co-processor, and that's an interesting part of the core since it holds all the crypto instruction stuff, which is implemented in the core. And pretty new, we see 15, we now have elliptic curve crypto cryptography in the core. Another really nice feature of the Z15 is the new on-chip compression facility. That's just on the chip, so 12 cores have to share it. It's a hardware facility implementing the deflate, compression, and decompression algorithm. And the implementation, the Linux support for that, actually was also done by the toolchain team. We have done the patches, we have published them onto the Zlib mailing list or issued the pull requests, and now they wait with 120 other pull requests, perhaps forever. <laughs> I don't know. We got the patches into ZlibNG, so that's a fork of ZLib. And we also got the support into GSIP. With that facility, compression is about 30 times faster than the software variant. And decompression about 10, I think. So it's quite impressive. Yeah, 40 terabyte max memory. <laughs> David already mentioned it, so that might be the future GCC host. <laughs> <laughs> and up to 190 usable cores. We had one, 170 cores with C14. And by the way, 32 terabytes. Okay, one thing I would like to mention is that since IBM Z13, we also have a publicly available microarchitecture document that's written by a distinguished engineer from the hardware. And he, so far, it only covers up to IBM Z14, but he promised to add the Z15 stuff as well. And that document describes tons of details about the architecture, the functional unit, branch prediction stuff, execution pipeline. So it's a really interesting read. I can really recommend it. <laughs> and the, the author also encourages everybody to 
ask questions in a forum or give uh, recommendations or ask for additions or something like that. So feel free <laughs> to challenge him on that. Yeah, we already discussed that's a bit awkward, but we, since we are allowed since Z14 to publish our patches before the announcement, so all the Z15 stuff has been upstreamed in February. We had to come up with some artificial CPU name since IBM doesn't tell us <laughs> what the CPU name will be before the announcement and if they would, we would not allow, be allowed to use it. So what we came up is using the edition number of the principles of operations manual. Principles of operation for, for the Z architecture is the ISA document, 1,500 pages or whatever, a heavy book, and it has a number on it, and we use it as an, for the MARC switch. So the patches, which are currently in GCC 9.1, uh, provide the option MARC ARC 13 and, M, and M tune ARC 13, and we pretty soon will add support for Z15. Of course, the artificial name will stay for compatibility reasons. We finally removed support for G5 and G6. We deprecated this uh, with these two levels, CPU levels with GCC 6, and now we have removed it. The reason is, isn't, hasn't anything to do with 31-bit support, it is just that these two machines did not provide instructions for relative addressing, relative branches and relative loads, and that makes it really hard in the back end. So we were able to remove quite some complex code from the back end due to that. And it doesn't hurt anybody since these are gone for 25 years. So. <laughs> okay, so finally, the first block of new instructions. These are all bit operations on general purpose registers, and basically it's all about merging bit inversions into standard bit operations, so there's nothing really fancy about it, but all, all of those uh, appear to be pretty useful. Implementing support in GCC is straightforward. You just have to figure out what the canonical RTX is for, the, for those, and then Combine will do the rest. All these instructions also provide a condition code, which indicates whether the target uh, register is zero or not afterwards. In order to make that condition code available for comparisons and optimizations, we, we had to tweak the standard uh, con conditionalized comparison hook for combine, and again, combine will do the rest, so nothing really fancy. We had a population count instruction before, but the version we had with C14 was only capable of counting bits within 8-bit blocks. So if you want the population count of a 64-bit value, you had to do some shifting and additions afterwards to accumulate all these values into one. Now we have an instruction which does all that in one go. Support for that also was straightforward. Okay, the next one is a bit more interesting. We, on IBM Z, we have a long history of interesting memory memory instructions. So we have quite a bunch of instructions which can operate on source and a target memory block of up to 256 bytes. And now we got another one. We can do bit operations with these memory blocks for a long time, and we also have a move instruction. And that move instruction we have so far is also provides a special mode when the uh, memory operands overlap. It then provide, promises that the result will be as if it would have been executed in a byte-by-byte -byte fashion from left to right. So you can use that instruction when, you, when the target memory block is at a higher address to implement a memset, for example, because the byte will get propagated through the mem <coughs> <coughs> the target memory block or you can use it to implement a memmove if you copy downwards. And now we have an instruction which does that in a right to left fashion. So we also can implement the memory move if we uh, copy to a higher address. We do that in glibc, implement this, uh, the implementation is already upstream and it works pretty fine. 
Okay. Yeah, one thing to mention about that instruction is the memory instructions we had so far have the length operand as an immediate field in the opcode. So at a first glance, you might think, okay, then you cannot use any dynamic length variables. But that's not true since we also have an interesting other instruction called execute. And with execute, you can point somewhere into memory and execute the instructions there while manipulating the opcode. And that has been used to overwrite the immediate length operand in these instructions to get a dynamic length into the memory uh, instructions. With the new instruction, that's not necessary anymore. You can put the length just <laughs> in a general purpose register, the obvious way. Okay. Next one is also quite interesting. It's a, a three-way load on condition or two-way two actually. So we now are able to have two source registers and one target register and depending on the condition code, either one or the other is loaded into the target register. We already had quite some uh, load on condition instructions, being able to load immediates into registers or load for memory or even store into memory on condition. And now we get another one. And after looking at a few examples, we were quite disappointed about how often it gets used or how rarely it get used, gets used. So we had a closer look at if conversion. That's an interesting pass in GCC. What I understand, it works somewhat like that when it comes to generating conditional moves. So there are different paths and different, uh, with different constraints and different requirements and different capabilities. Unfortunately, they tend to overlap each other a bit. There is that large block of functions starting with no CE. No CE is standing for uh, no conditional execution. No co conditional execution targets usually want to do something different. What these functions have in common is that they base their cost calculation on RTX cost. They do that for the original sequence of RTX and do that for the to be generated uh, sequence and then compare it to figure out whether it's worthwhile doing. That's a bit different for the conditional move, uh, cont move functions. As I understand it, it basically just counts the instance and has an upper limit until which it is worthwhile. Then the difference between these functions yeah, there's the, they are, by the way, they are also executed roughly in that order I have listed them. That also might be important. The convert multiple set, as it, the name suggests, is able to also to convert multiple set assignments in an if block into several load on condition instructions. So far, it does only, does that only for register register moves, but it has a, uh, interesting capability, it can also deal with dependencies within the Zen block and also with, uh, with dependencies between assignments in the Zen block and the condition. It does it by generating tons of temporaries around it, which resolve all that. Unfortunately, <laughs> all these assignments to temporaries are part of the cost calculation, so that makes it almost always too expensive but we will see that later. Node CE try move, try C move, that's the, basically the standard function to come up with a conditional move. Try C move arithmetic, that's useful when you, for example, uh, try to load from memory, uh, from two different memory locations, and the memory location can be loaded, the base address of the memory location can be loaded with a lo load on condition, for example. We don't really ne need that because we have a load on condition for memory but it's useful, for example, for x86. Yeah, and the conditional move convert if block, it also deals with multiple sets. It can have registers or constants as source operands, and it also deals with else blocks. That's a difference compared to the uh, convert multiple set, but it does not deal with dependencies. So they have some overlap, but it's not exactly clear <laughs> where you will uh, end up. Okay, so what we did is 
we did some profiling across spec CPU 2017 to figure out what pass over through if conversion is really useful for us. And yeah, that was a big surprise to me. So as I already explained, convert multiple set has its problems and yeah, it is not used <laughs> in our, for our backend. From reading the code, I would have expected that try C move will do a lot of work for us, but in fact, it doesn't. Try C move arithmetic, that's kind of expected, and the rest is yeah, basically the reminder. The line below the percentages show what I found in the assembler output as instructions. So I have most useful instruction, conditional load instruction on Z is loading an immediate into a register. 65,000. And another interesting fact is that by far the majority of conditional moves is not expanded by the if conversion pass. They come obviously from somewhere else. And that happens already in RTL expansion. The examples I've looked at were almost always uh, Gimple max expressions, which have been extended then to a conditional load. Yeah, in order to figure out whether it's our target or it's a general C uh, GCC problem, you usually try to compare with x86. And it, in fact, looks much more balanced here. <laughs> so, yeah, so we tried to improve the situation for our target. And uh, a colleague, Robin Dub, was working on that. And right now, a patch set is on the mailing list uh, under discussion with Richard Sandiford and others. And what he did is basically implement uh, certain improvements. Namely, he added support for uh, source constant source operands in convert multiple set. This is especially useful for us. Then he reduced the number of temporaries created in that function to the number, to the limit that only for the really required dependencies you still generate the temporaries and all the unnecessary temporaries will be skipped right away. Then there's also that problem that the if conversion pass does a con uh, canonicalized condition on every of the conditions. It tries from the CC mode condition, it tries to follow up the pass to the real comparison. And then sometimes it ends up with a really com complex comparison and would have to, regener to regenerate this comparison for the conditional loads as well and gives that to the backend. And the backend says, then, oh, that's too expensive. <laughs> Let it be. So one trick might be to extract the actual CC mode comparison from the conditional branch and try to, the, try to do the cost calculation with that. There are already quite some places in if conversion which do that as kind of a hack. Yeah, and we have imp and also some backend changes, implement the conditional move patterns with uh, min max for floating point values, that was also pretty useful. Okay, the result after that looks like the line below. So as you can see, convert multiple set, big improvement, now helps a lot uh, when, when it comes to generating conditional moves. Try C move as well, much more. Try C move arithmetic, as expected, not that useful. It's mostly covered by try C move already then or other cases. So it looks already much better, and I hope we get the patch that into GCC accepted. As a comparison for x86, there's not much of a difference, but also convert multiple sets uh, improves a lot. But the rest basically stays the same. Okay, but the problem is, when emitting more load on conditions, it's not always a win, depending on the architecture. I think on recent x86 machines, this conditional move is always faster than doing a branch, but unfortunately, we ran into some regressions. And we already guessed that this has to do with branches which are very well predicted and get omitted. 
And, but in order to get some numbers and a feel about what's really going on, I tried to run some benchmarks. I found a really tiny benchmark on GitHub somewhere. And what it does is basically it fills an array of 2K Boolean values with random values with a certain distribution and then uses that uh, to do an assignment depending on the Boolean value. It compiles that into three different variants, one with a loading condition and two with conditional branches. And the conditional branches are, may, are uh, emitted with built and expect so that they one time go into that direction and the other time in the other. And running that, you can, you can do a graph across the distribution of the Boolean values on the x-axis. What you see is that. In the middle, where you have 50-50 Boolean truth, uh, truth and false values in the array, replacing such a branch with a loader condition is a huge win, obviously. It's hard to predict, and so it will be always, almost always wrong. So a load and condition reduces that effort. But what you can also see is that on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, there are a few cases where actually the branch is faster. And that always happens if the branch is not taken and well predicted. So the conclusion basically is we have to avoid these cases and we will try to do that in the target hook which uh, tells the if conversion path whether, whether it's worthwhile doing if conversion towards a conditional move or not. And we, will, we haven't done that yet, but there are routines in predict.c which try to derive the predictability of branches from branch probabilities of different edges. So, yeah, we will see how this works, will work out. But still, of course, with all the fancy branch prediction stuff we have nowadays in a CPU with neural networks, perceptrons, and branch history tables, and whatever, you might, of course, also be able to predict the branch, which is totally unexpected. So, <laughs> okay, that's bad luck then. GCC is not, will not be able to figure that out. And especially when it comes to replacing uh, multiple sets, the cost calculation needs to be really precise, and that's really a problem. That's where you easily can create a regression. As I mentioned, we also have a store-on condition. That's not really supported right now by if conversion. The only store-on store condition instructions emitted for IBM Z are basically emitted by combine of merging a load-on condition register register with a store. That's fine, but perhaps we can get better here in case if conversion would be able to support it. Okay, more instructions, new with Z15. We got the, uh, finally we got the vector convert between 32-bit elements, floating point between, between floating point and integers. That basically was just an oversight that we hadn't that instruction before, so we now got it and it was easy to implement. We already had a shift left and right instruction for the entire vector. That instruction required that you in every byte you load the very same shift count and then every byte will be shifted by that amount of bits and the bits shifted out on the left hand side will be inserted into the byte to the left. So pretty straightforward. But with C15, they have now lifted the requirement of having <laughs> in each byte the same shift value. I have no idea what we can use that instruction for, but usually I would suspect the crypto guys request such things, but I have no idea. <clears throat> it's useful to do some things with bit fields. Do you have that on power as well? Yeah, we have it since power now. So, yeah. Okay. So I will look into the power backend, thanks. 
we don't actually use anything like that on in our back end, but that's why it is in the CPU. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and we got other shift instructions. Uh, shift left, right, uh, left, right, double. It's basically concatenating to 128-bit vector registers and then pick a 128-bit window out of these 256 bits and load that into a target register. That might be useful, but I haven't been able to come up with a pattern which is matched by GCC so far. But yeah, further to do. Vector alignment hints. We can add vector alignment hints to uh, vector loads, vector stores, and vector load and store multiple. We can do that already since IBM Z14, but IBM Z15 is a first machine which actually exploits that. So far, a vector load, uh, a normal vector load on Z14 had to do actually two steps to load the entire 16 bits. And if you, if you give it the right alignment hint now, it can do the, the entire 16 bits in one go. So with two load store units, you now have a, you can load a 32 bits per cycle. But as usual, do not lie to the hardware. It will come back and bite you. If you give it a wrong hint, it will be more expensive than giving no hint. The implementation just uses a print uh, operant modifier to add the hint to the instruction output string. So, okay. Then we got more instructions for byte swaps and element swaps. So, we, the first two instructions uh, do a byte swap on all of, all of the elements of a vector. Second, the, the store byte uh, reversed element is for a single element coming from memory or being stored to memory. Then when loading a scalar into a vector register, you can do a byte swap and then at the same time zero out all the other elements or replicate the byte swap element into all the other elements. Okay. <laughs> and we also can reverse the order of the elements in a vector. That's probably useful since, given that we are the last big Indian target, <laughs> we have to prepare for such things. Yeah, I've added built-ins to GCC to, to make these instructions usable, but I wasn't able so far to make GCC actually generate them itself. I tried the, the B-swap pattern, straightforward, but it's never called for vector modes as I've noticed. And so the second plan was to implement the vector param const target macro. That's the target macro where you can say that you support certain constant permutation patterns, but unfortunately <laughs> the middle end never asks me for these patterns. So it doesn't work out so far. But that's work in progress. Next instruction is Vector substring search. That's actually really powerful instruction. You can give it one string in a vector register and you give it another in the other and it will look for a substring match in the other uh, vector register. There is an option to uh, tell the instruction whether it should look for a zero termination uh, character. So you can use it for strstr as well as for mem mem basically. Yeah, and as a result, it will give you the index where that substring has been found or where a partial match has been found in the haystack string. We use it in glibc to implement strstro and bamam with needle lengths up to nine characters. I will explain some more why we have that limit. <laughs> And so far, we use it only for 8-bit eight uh, eight character strings. The instruction actually also supports 16-bit characters and 32-bit characters. But of course, you only get four characters into a vector register than you. Otherwise, <laughs> you would have to split the needle on two across more vector registers. 
The code is upstream. It's all in glibc230, which is available since August the 1st. Okay, a few words about why we only support needles up to nine characters. The problem is, is just, on, you can see on the right-hand side, two examples where you would get partial matches very often. So for example, if you have a haystack stack string of just A's and a needle of AAAAC, you would basically at every byte get a partial match and then would have to decide, okay, I need one more byte to, to decide whether it's a partial or full match. And then you would see, oh no, no match. So we continue and so we advance through the haystack string just by one byte after another. The worst case when doing that with a nine character needle is that you always can advance by eight bytes. And that was a good trade-off. We can improve on that, of course, by analyzing the needle string a bit, whether it has such repetitive patterns. But of course, this costs some extra cycles and you have to win that back first. And if we have that, then we could also think about spreading the needle across several vector registers in order to support much longer needles. And if you have that, we might also think about white character strings support. But so far there appears to be, does not appear to be much need for white character string performance. At least the glibc implementation of a string for white characters does not appear to be very performant. It's more straightforward. Okay. So, just to figure out how useful or how often will GCC be able to match these instructions. Yeah, they, they have pretty specific use cases, so you cannot expect to find the new Z15 instructions all over the code. That is confirmed by that chart. The most useful or most often uh, used instruction is the 32-bit select instruction, then the 32-bit vector convert, but in that case it starts with W, that means it works only on the scalar, on the first element of the vector, so it's basically a scalar instruction. That's still useful because we have more vector registers than we have floating point registers, so GCC still likes it. Then a few lines below that, there's also the vector variant of that, and the end with complement, yeah, for deleting bits, obviously a useful instruction. Okay, since I was not able to provide any performance numbers right now, since we do not have any stable measurements on GA level machines, I just did some static counting on vectorizations. Perhaps that is useful across across the last generations of GCC, the, the blue bars are basic block vectorizations. So the pure number of basic, the sum of vectorizations, basic block vectorizations across spec CPU 2017. And the red bars are the loop vectorizations. And as you can see, GCC improved quite a lot over time. The really big difference, unfortunately, does not come with the MR switches, but it usually came later with probably more back-end tuning or great middle-end changes in the vectorizer, perhaps. But as you can see, over time, the number of vectorizations over the last generations of GCC has vastly improved for IBM Z, and so I think we are about to close the gap to other architectures which have vectorization for a much longer time. So we will continue, of course, with that, but I think we are on the right track. I also did a comparison between no fast mass and fast mass, and to be honest, I expected a much bigger difference here, and that also was confirmed by other guys, so we probably have to look into what, what goes wrong here. I'm not sure how it is on power, for example, is there a bigger difference, but on, on x86, the, uh, this is just the number of factorizations, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't think there's so much difference. Between
in fast mode than no fast mode. Okay. Anyway, it will be different speed, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. if if you do vectorization in the right places, it can still make a huge difference, right? So just counting the vectorizations is just one thing. These, but still, at least I want to show some performance numbers and people are often interested in comparing GCC and LVM. We can say that for IBM Z, both compilers are on par. So its performance is quite comparable. There's sometimes LVM is better, sometimes GCC. So we have a, we have a very small team, but we have a healthy competition in that team <laughs> to improve on that. And in fact, it helps both compilers. Yeah. The contributors, as I said, this, we have a small team and this is really the entire team. <laughs> GDB and Valgan support for Z15 is not ready yet, but is about to be completed. Zlib is there, but not upstream. LVM, also, I should rather switch to that one. <laughs> Binutils GCC support, of course, is there. Still using the ARC13 switch. We will change that pretty soon. LVM9 support is there. The latest release is just a month ago, or, or does it even ha happen? The latest I've seen is, uh, is <coughs> the release has not yet happened there at release candidate four right now, which is hopefully going to be the final one, unless they find something else. Okay. Happen. But it's any day now. <laughs> but it, it, it comes right away with IBM C15 support, even if it's called ARC13. And Valgrind and GDB is something people try to tackle in the future. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions? Um, this is probably exposed to my ignorance of the architecture, but are there any new security instructions, say branch signing or um, stack protections, that kind of thing? Um, no, nothing new with C15. <laughs> you mean, yeah, crypto instructions. We have support for hardware cryptographic arithmetic. Yeah, so it's not that type of security that you're referring to, yes. but we do have in the crypto core processor, uh, which has been in there for a long time and which is getting enhanced every iteration, we have a number of additional algorithms and a number of additional stuff. In particular, I think this time is for the first time elliptic curve cryptography as a hardware accelerated instruction uh, in there. So, yeah. Sorry, I missed the, uh, the very beginning of your talk, but in a nutshell, Z15, what's the, uh, the kind of customer benefit over Z14 and earlier? The customer benefit? Yeah, so why does it exist? Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, of course, there is increased performance of the entire machine. It's, I'm not sure about the exact numbers, but it's about 14%, I think. And there are the new features, the elliptic curve, cryptography is an important thing, and also the uh, on-chip compression. That's a really big feature for Z15, and it's also a complicated one. Thank you. The 19-inch rack size, yeah, that's a practical. Yeah, then more memory, more usable cores and all that. Okay. If there are no other questions, thanks for joining the talk and enjoy your stay. <laughs>